All right, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. In this video, I'd like to discuss the uh, two lines of attack on the NHS appearing on the front pages of two very different client newspapers today for the Tories. Two prongs of the same attack. The Daily Telegraph trying to attack the unsuitability of the NHS rather than point to the fact it was perfectly suitable when Labour were mysteriously last in power. And the Daily Mail trying to claim that the NHS is wasting money by spending it on shock horror training staff. Not how they put it, of course. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So the thing that mostly upsets me about people who prioritise their narrow-minded, petty little political ideology over practical politics is that it results in real pain and suffering. These people, some of whom are very well-meaning, arguing about the nth degree of a policy whilst allowing the Tories to systematically dismantle the country around us. I look at what's going on. What's been going on for over a decade now? The Conservatives have been unpicking our healthcare, education, policing the courts, the very fabric of our country. Reminds me of a student I had in the last school I worked at a very long time ago now. I've mostly been worked in colleges. Wasn't an evil child, but he was a bit of a tosser. One time he had this box of files on his desk. I was talking to my head of department who'd come into the room and he slowly started inching it towards the edge of the desk, thinking nobody was looking, thinking we were both distracted while we were talking to each other. But a teacher in a school, you have to have your eyes everywhere. And he inched it further and further until it went over and hit the deck, creating the intended distraction, thinking he'd get away with it because no one would have seen who did it. But we were watching him. We knew what he was up to. But the Tories are doing the same with our country, pushing bits of it over the abyss while we're not looking. I want to take a look at a couple of headlines about the NHS today, in today's newspapers. But before I do, let's present a hypothesis to consider. I think the Conservatives want to destroy the NHS. They can't say so publicly because the public love it. In fact, to win elections, they have to promise to preserve it, support it. But they want it gone. We know that a great many prominent Tories have argued for a US-style system. That would be the US-style system that is the worst healthcare system of all advanced economies. Well, for the patients anyway. Not those who own the system. Oh no, they love it. So the Conservatives have to pretend that they are supporting the NHS, but they need it to fail in order to claim that the model just doesn't work, despite best intentions all round, and it needs changing. To this end, look at what they've done. They, on the small end, they force NHS workers to pay for parking at their own place of work, squeezing their too low wages much, much more. They keep the, the wages of nurses down again, making it a financially difficult decision to remain in nursing. So it's to encourage more to leave the profession. They refuse to put nurses on the shortage occupation list of their shiny new post-Brexit immigration system, making it more difficult to attract nurses from overseas. We've got a shortage of tens of thousands. How are they not on the shortage list? List. They keep doctors on an NHS reserve list, despite being about 20,000 doctors short there. And I know people say, well, there's sensible reasons for a reserve list. We're short. Why? We're short. They force the NHS to award contracts to private providers for treatments they could offer themselves. I know Labour got stick for combining private providers in the NHS under Blair, and I was an opponent of that at the time. But that was adding provision. It wasn't taking existing provision and swapping it out for private provision, as the Tories have done. And now the latest is that the NHS trust boards have private healthcare providers on them. So when decisions have been made at the local level about how to allocate healthcare resources, that means money, it's private healthcare providers with their very clear conflicts of interest who will decide. I'm sorry, but at this point, I'm just going to say the NHS has been privatised. It's not a risk. It's been done. We're still paying taxes. Those taxes are still being allocated to healthcare. So there's still a publicly funding model buried in there. But a lot of that funding goes to private providers, not state-owned organisations. And it's the private providers who decide how those tax uh, pounds are spent. It's basically privatised. It's already happened. But it's still not enough for the Tories. They want it obliterated to the point where a future government can do nothing to re reverse it. Unless it wants to completely start again. 
and it's doubtful that a future government would be allowed to. Rebuilding after the war was one thing, and that still ultimately cost power for the government that did it. These days, impossible. Once it's gone, it's gone. That's gone. So these newspapers, the Daily, the Daily Telegraph first, should we do? Avoid A&E, says NHS, as winter crisis bites early. Now let's look at the word in here. There are two things that jumped out to me. Second bit first, as winter crisis bites early. What absolute hogwash. This isn't the winter crisis starting early. It's not even close to winter, it's midsummer. This isn't a winter crisis, it's just a crisis. The winter crisis is called the winter crisis because of the prevalence of illnesses which propagate very easily when people are jammed into warm, poorly ventilated places for long periods of time. This happens in colder weather, not summer. If the NHS cannot cope in summer, it's because it's had its resources stripped from it over the past 12 years. Also, even referring to a winter crisis to normalise the term. We're not supposed to have crises in winter that are predictable. Winter crisis means it happens every year. Yeah, it does. It's not supposed to. If we know it's these, if we're going to have this need every year, why don't we have the provision to meet that need? Our provision should be set at just above the level needed. Like, imagine if a power station took the same approach as the Department for Health. If they just generated a set amount of power, right, we reckon... The average across the year is this amount of power needed. So that's what we're going to produce all the time. Never changes. We'd be getting power cuts every time Coronation Street had a commercial break. Hardly ever get ha have enough power in winter, would we? That's what's happening with our healthcare. You're supposed to set your provision at a bit above what you're expecting the greatest demand to be. Does that mean slack at some times a year? Yes, but the purpose of public health care is not to have nurses running around like blue ass flies, but to make sure that we can keep our population fit and healthy. You know, if you've got slack times of the year as a result of that, what would be overstaffing at some times a year, that's your golden opportunity to, for training, isn't it? This is an economic as well as a moral concept. Fitter, healthier workers are more productive. Then there's the first part of the headline, avoid A&E says NHS. This is making it sound like the NHS is telling people to stop using their services because they can't deliver it. And sure enough, this is basically what's happening. But the implication is that the NHS isn't managing and it's pointing out that it isn't managing in summer or imagine what it'd be like in winter. Now, someone like me thinks about that and gets angry with the government for underfunding and under-resourcing the NHS. But someone who doesn't realise it's deliberate government sabotage might think the people telling them that the public funding model for the NHS isn't working. They don't remember back to 2010, apparently, when it works bloody well. They're not aware of other countries with public health care where it works very well as well. No, they just see it failing and getting worse each year and someone in their newspaper quietly whispering in their ear that the funding model is all wrong. Then the Daily Mail, even more blatant in its attack. Although, to be fair, nobody ever accused the Daily Mail of being subtle. NHS blows £1 million on woke groups for staff. Now, dig a little deeper in the article. You don't have to go very far. What it means is that money is spent on staff training in the NHS. Oh, dear. But again, break down the literal meaning of the headline and the first part of the article, and you'd wonder what they're complaining about. It talks about 36,000 hours spent on this training. Well, how are we to judge that amount of time? What does that mean? It's not 36,000 hours spent per person, is it? How many people? Is it spread across all NHS staff? If that's spread across all NHS staff, that amounts to less than two minutes of training. In reality, of course, it's, it can't mean every member of staff. But unless they say how many, the article's not actually telling us how much time was spent on this training, is it? 36,000 hours. It's one of those nonsense figures used a lot in politics to make it sound like a lot, but it's actually meaningless. It means nothing. We've, there's no information there. It's data without information. And what are these woke groups? Well, first of all, another case of using the term woke offensively. The literal dictionary definition of woke is being aware of social issues. Why on earth would it be a waste of money that some unspecified number of NHS staff are trained in awareness of social issues? I mean, as a teacher, I had regular training on social issues, at least twice a year, I would say. Is that a waste as well? Actually, I'm sure if the Daily Mail were trying to argue for publicly funded schools to be abolished, they would. 
Both articles take in a different line of attack on the NHS, but both clearly doing so. They're designed to suggest some great problem with the way things have been run, but completely exclude the people actually making the decisions from, from their criticism, the government. Who decides what goes on in any public organisation? Who decides how funding is allocated? Who decides how much funding? Who decides this? Who decides that? The Secretary of State and the Prime Minister, ultimately. But they don't criticise ministers because what they want is not for this government to be gone, but the NHS. And what really gets me is that they're not far from getting what they want. You know, while people who are opposed to this argue about stupid little differences with the, the person trying to stand shoulder to shoulder with them, that crate of files has been pushed ever close to the edge of the desk and hardly any bugger is watching. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.